So I've gotten a lot of feedback lately about problem number 20 on the homework that you were having some difficulty with it. And it is kind of a confusing problem. So I wanted to go through some techniques for solving it. So the problem, if I can pull it up here, the problem says cyclic neutropenia is a blood disorder in humans characterized by periodic fluctuations in the density of a certain kind of blood cell called neutrophils. This density of neutrophils reaches highs of around 1,950 cells per microliter and lows near zero. The period of fluctuations is approximately 21 days. Model the temporal dynamics of neutrophils in days, assuming that the density is at its highest on day zero. So the problem is a little bit ambiguous but that's just kind of how modeling goes. I'd say if you have something that undergoes periodic fluctuations, then that's a signal that a sine or a cosine kind of wave might be a good model for this. It's not necessarily true, but at least it's a starting point. And I think that the, the author of this question intended for you to use sine or cosine to model the situation. And the fact that the density is highest on day zero suggests that you should use a function whose peak is at zero. Now, let me show you how I model this using Desmos. I'm going to start with the graph of cosine of x. Here it is. So it's this red graph here. You can see that the peak is when x is equal to zero. Or if x here represents the time axis, then the peak is at time zero. Now, what you need to be able to do to solve this problem is you need to be able to adjust the height of this sine wave, or this cosine wave, you need to adjust its amplitude, it's called. You need to be able to adjust its period, which is the distance between peaks. And you need to be able to adjust the height so that the top goes up to where it should go and the bottom is down at zero. So let's do this first by adjusting this so that the amplitude is what it needs to be. And from this, we know that the highs should be around 1950 and the lows should be around zero. So the amplitude, the height from peak to valley, should be about 1950. And the first thing you might try to do is to just stretch this by 1950. But, oh, and after this, let me do something else, which is to adjust the axes to make them easier to see. So if you go into graph settings, I can actually make the graph go from, say, negative 2,000 on the y to positive 2,000. So now we can see the tops and the bottoms a little bit better. Here, the top is at 1950, but the bottom is at negative 1950. And that's too low. We want it to go from 0 to 1950. So really, we've kind of scaled it by twice as much as we should have. So let's instead scale this by half of 1950, which is 1950 over 2. It doesn't really matter what that number is for now. And now the distance from top to bottom is exactly 1950. But the bottom now is all the way down at negative 975, where we wanted this to be at 0. So let's shift the entire graph upwards by 975. Now the graph looks a lot better. It goes down to zero and up to 1950. But the next thing we have to adjust is the period of the function, the distance between peaks, because we want that distance to be exactly 21 days. Let me start by adjusting the x-axis so that we'll be able to see what happens. So instead of going from negative 10 to 10, let me go from about negative 50 to 50. And somehow that didn't work. So let me try this again. So, ah, negative 50 to 50. There we go. Okay, so right now, the oscillations are happening too quickly. The period is 2 pi. So the way to adjust the period is to stretch this in the x direction. And let me do this in two steps. First, I'm going to multiply x by 2 pi, and that kind of goes in the wrong direction. 
But now, so that's shrunk it. So now the period is actually one. If you go from zero, the first peak, the next peak is at one. And now let me divide by 21. So that has the effect of shrinking it by a factor of two pi, kind of getting rid of the old period, and then stretching it by a factor of 21 so that the next peak is actually 21 units off here to the right. So when I do this modeling in Desmos, it allows me to do every step and just kind of check that I'm right along the way. And I can see that the period is 21 days, that the amplitude is 1950, that it goes from zero all the way up to 1950, and that the bottom and the top are where they should be. Um, now, I, I think uh, that I've actually used a term incorrectly in this little mini lecture. My recollection is that amplitude is actually used for the distance from halfway to the top. So I've misused the term amplitude uh, in this little explanation, um, but I think that you get the idea that the vertical goes from zero at the bottom up to 1950 at the top, which is what the problem asked you to do. So here we have highs are around 1950 and lows at zero, and the period 21 days. Another question that I've gotten frequently in the surveys is about the first homework, problem number 27. And this problem says, let f and g be linear functions with equations f of x is equal to m1x plus b1, and g of x is equal to m2x plus b2. Is f composed with g, let's say you read the f little circle g, is f composed with g a linear function? So in this case, both f and g are linear functions. So the graph of f has slope m1 and y-intercept b1, and the slope of g of x has, the slope is m2, and the y-intercept is b2. Now to answer this question, I'm not gonna do it by uh, figuring out the general case, but let's take a specific example. Let's imagine the case where f of x is the linear function, let's take 3x minus 2, and g of x, some other linear function, maybe it's 7x plus 1. And f composed with g, this of x, by definition, this means f of g of x. which means that we put the g of x into the input box for f. So that's 3 times g of x minus 2. And g of x is 7x plus 1. So that's 3. I put 7x plus 1 in the box in parentheses because I want to keep it grouped. Minus 2. And I simplify this, 3 times 7x is 21x, 3 times 1 is 3, minus 2, and that's equal to 21x plus 1. Now, if we want to look at this function, 21x plus 1, and how it relates to the functions f and g. It's a little bit hard to see, but there's definitely a relationship between the number 21, the slope of the linear function f composed with g, and 3 and 7, the slopes of f and the slopes of g. 3 times 7 is equal to 21. So it turns out that the slope, well, it turns out first of all, that f of g is a linear function. at least in this example it is, and its slope is the product of the two slopes. 
is the slope of the line given by f times the slope of the line given by g. Now I've shown this in one example, and to really answer this question definitively, you should use these constants m1, m2, b1, b2, instead of 3, negative 2, 7, and 1. But the same methodology will work, and you'll see how the slopes get multiplied together as part of this algebra uh, to find the slope of f composed with g. So the slope will end up being m1 times m2, no matter what m1 and m2 I choose. Welcome back to Math 11a. This is week two of the course, lecture number four. This week we're going to talk about exponential functions and logarithmic functions and log plots and log log plots. It's kind of a key topic in the course. Um, these sort of functions are very important in understanding the life sciences and the physical sciences. They show up all over the place. Uh, today we're going to focus on exponential functions and exponential growth. Um, if you like, here's a cat. And with that, I'm going to start recording. So I'd like to begin today's lecture by using Desmos to explore exponential functions a little bit. And let's start with the exponential function y is equal to something to the x power. And I'm going to look at when that something, that base, which we'll call b, is greater than 1. So for example, when if I, if I said b to be 1, then we're looking at y is equal to 1 to the x, which is just y is equal to 1, because 1 to any power is just 1. But as soon as b gets bigger, the graph starts pulling upwards on the right side, and it exhibits what we call exponential growth. So if I look at the function y is equal to 2 to the x, it's quite flat. It's very, very close to the x-axis. It has an asymptote, a horizontal asymptote, as x goes towards negative infinity, this part is very flat, then it climbs up and up and up gradually through the point 0, 1, because 2 raised to the 0 power is 1, and then it shoots up very, very high very quickly, and it keeps on going like that forever. This is the exponential function y is equal to 2 to the x. As I change this base, if it's closer to 1, then it's a more gradual exponential growth. But even for something like 1.1, it looks very gradual, but if I scroll out far enough, this also climbs up and gets very steep, but just a little bit later than the other ones. Now, I'd like to put in a little bit more features here. I want to look at this landmark point here at 0, 1. And what I want to look at is the slope of this curve at this point. And in calculus terms, what this means is I want to look at the line which just barely brushes this curve at this point. This green dotted line is called a tangent line to the curve at the point 0, 1. And I've graphed this tangent line because I happen to know the formula for it. We're going to learn how to do this maybe in a couple weeks. Here's the tangent line. And I'll put in another point on the tangent line it's right about there. And the reason that I'm putting in this point is that that point allows us to compute the slope of the line by using the rise over the run. So by using these two points, 0, 1 and 1, 1, 1.693, the rise is 0.693 and the run is 1, and therefore the slope is 0.693. The slope of the tangent line is 0.693. Or if you'd like, the slope of this curve at this landmark point, 0, 1, the exponential curve has slope about 0.693 at this point. If I increase the base, so instead of y equals 2 to the x, I consider something steeper, like y equals 3 to the x, then this slope increases. Here the slope would be the rise, which is about uh, a little bit more than 1. It's 1.1, roughly. And the run is 1, so the slope here is about 1.1. It's slightly steeper than a perfect diagonal. If I increase b further, then the slope becomes larger, 
When b is 4, the slope is about 1.386. The rise from this point to this point is about 1.386. So b also controls that slope at that landmark point. That landmark point here at 0, 1 doesn't change with b, but the slope certainly does. Now there's one kind of magical slope right around 2.7. When the base is 2.7, this slope is very, very close to 1. In fact, if I set b to be 2.7182818.2, then we get a slope that's just about perfectly equal to the 1. This green line is perfectly diagonal. It has a rise of 1 and a run of 1, when the base is this special number 2.7182818.2. And what is this number? This is the number that we call e. e is a number like pi that just occurs all over the place in mathematics. And one way to characterize e is that it's the unique base in an exponential function which gets you a slope of 1 at that landmark point. The green dotted line has slope 1 when b is equal to this number, which we call e. Now I'd like to use the tablet to explore exponential functions in a few examples. And one kind of problem that you might see would be a problem that asks you to find a function whose graph passes through some points. So imagine we wanted a function whose graph passes through the points 1, 6 here and 4, 48 up here. If we were looking for a linear function, like this gray dotted line, then we could find it using, well, if you might know a two-point formula for the equation for a line, but you might use the formula y equals mx plus b for a linear function, and then find the m and the b, which makes the line pass through these points. For example, passing through the point 1, 6 means that 6 has to equal m times 1 plus b, and passing through 4 comma 48 means that 48 is equal to m times 4 plus b. Putting these two equations together and subtracting yields 48 minus 4, or I'm sorry, 48 minus 6, which is 42, is equal to 4m minus m, which is 3m. And so m is equal to 42 divided by 3, which happens to equal 14. Plugging this back in to this equation, for example, we find that 6 is equal to 14 plus b, and b then is 6 minus 14. So the linear equation, or the linear function, is y is equal to mx plus b, 14x minus 8. That's the equation of the gray line. Now, it might be that the situation is such that we'd expect an exponential function instead of a linear function, because exponential functions occur all the time in nature. Exponential decay when you're doing carbon dating, exponential growth when you're looking at bacteria growing on a plate. So let's find an exponential function that passes through the points 1, 6, and 4, 48. The general form of an exponential function is y is equal to Instead of mx plus b, we usually use a form a constant c times a base to the x. And we can do the same thing plugging in this xy pair, 1, 6, and this xy pair, 4, 48, to find the b and the c. Plugging in 1 and 6 for x and y tells us that 6 is 
is equal to c times b to the first power. Plugging in 48 and 4 tells us 48 for y is equal to c times the base to the fourth power. Now, if I divide one equation by another, what I find is that 48 divided by 6 is equal to 8. C divided by C is 1. And so 8 is equal to B to the fourth divided by B to the first, which is B cubed. Now, I'm not sure if you've divided one equation by another, but it's a valid thing to do as long as you're not dividing by 0. And in this case, you know that the left side here is 6, so the right side is 6. So I'm not so worried about division by 0. Now I found that b cubed is equal to 8. And I asked myself, what number raised to the third power is 8? And the answer is 2. If you'd like, you can also do this with logarithms. Or actually, I'm sorry, with cube roots. So b is the cube root of 8. We'll get to logarithms later. Now to figure out c, what I can do is notice that 6 is equal to c times b to the first power. So 6 is equal to c times 2 to the first power. And 2 to the first power is 2. So c is equal to 6 divided by 2, which is 3. And the exponential function happens to be y is equal to 3 times 2 to the x power. So this describes the blue curve, the exponential function. Both linear functions and exponential functions are fairly simple functions in the sense that both involve two parameters. A linear function involves an m and a b, a slope and a y-intercept. An exponential function has two parameters. One is this c parameter. c controls where the landmark point is at zero, and b, which is the growth rate, or decay rate, if b is less than one. So now that we've discussed exponential growth in exponential functions, I'm going to look at exponential decay with the classic example of radiocarbon dating. Now for background, the atmosphere contains about one atom of a carbon isotope, carbon-14. For every trillion atoms, that's 10 to the 12th, of what we'd call a normal carbon-12. There's another isotope, carbon-13, that occurs, but let's ignore that for now. So normal carbon is carbon-12, unusual carbon is carbon-14, and these exist in a proportion of about one per every trillion. So carbon-14 is fairly rare. It's continually refreshed in the atmosphere by cosmic rays, so over time this does vary, but not a terrible amount. Uh, a large portion of variation recently was due to nuclear testing in the late 20th century, and there are some fluctuations over time that uh, scientists have been able to figure out. Now, when plants are alive, they uh, turn that carbon in the atmosphere into the carbon in themselves, in the plants. So they inhale the carbon dioxide and that carbon later becomes the structure of those plants. And so living plants inherit that ratio of about one atom of carbon-14 for every atom of carbon-12 in the plants. Now, this is constantly refreshed because living plants are respirating, they're taking in the atmosphere. But when plants die, those carbon-14 atoms start to decay back into their normal carbon-12. Uh, well, actually, they don't decay into carbon-12. That's not quite right. They decay into, I think, nitrogen-14. But anyways, they effectively disappear, leaving only the carbon-12 left. Okay, now how long does carbon-14 take to decay? We measure this with what's called the half-life. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years, plus or minus 40 or so. 
So it's approximately 5,700 years. And what this means is that if we start with a certain amount of carbon-14, say 500 nanograms, a pretty small amount of carbon-14, then after 5,730 years, Five thousand seven hundred and thirty years after the plant dies, I'll say the time is fifty seven thirty, measuring the time from the plant's death, and the amount of carbon is half of what it was before. So if it was five hundred nanograms, the amount of carbon becomes two hundred and fifty nanograms. And after another five thousand seven hundred and thirty years, which brings us to a total of ten thousand. 460 years, the amount of carbon will be half of what it was before, which is 125 nanograms. And after another 5,730 years, I think we're at 16,190 years, the amount of carbon will be half of this, which is 62.5 nanograms. And if we want to express this as a function, rather than jumping in intervals of half-lifes and cutting in half every time, the way we do this is that the amount of carbon is equal to how much we start with, which is 500 in nanograms, and then we repeatedly multiply by a half for every unit of half-life. And the way to express this is this is one half raised to the time divided by 5730. Or this is more commonly written as 500. Taking one half to an exponent is the same as taking two to the negative exponent. That's two to the negative time divided by 5730. So let me show you what this kind of function looks like. This is a classic function of exponential decay. Here. It's an exponential function. There's a constant, there's a base, and there's an exponent. And here the base is 2, and the exponent is a number that depends on t, but with a negative in front, which makes it exponential decay rather than exponential growth. So I'll pull up Desmos for a moment. Here's the function graphed, and what we see is that we start with about 500 nanograms, and it decays quickly. Here's one half-life, about 5,700 years is right around here. We're at about half as much as we started with. And then another 5,700 years, we're at half as much of that, about 125, maybe right around here. And then another half-life, and we're at, I guess, an eighth of where we started. About 62.5 nanograms right here after 16,000 years or so. Okay, so this is what the graph of exponential decay looks like. Um, if I zoom out, it looks a lot like exponential growth, but it's just flipped across the y-axis. Now, a question that I always have when I see these things is, how on earth do they detect such small amounts of carbon-14? 500 nanograms, that's 500 billionths of a gram of carbon-14. And this is a reasonable number, actually. I kind of, uh, this is a ballpark estimate of how much you might find if you have a whole tree. But they can actually do this with individual seeds, where you might get 500, not nanograms, but picograms, trillionths of a gram. And you might be able to date things that are tens of thousands of years old. Well, for that, you need to be able to accurately measure the amount of carbon-14 in very, very small amounts. And how do they do that? Well, it seems that they use something called a accelerator mass spectrometer. Here's the one over at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Uh, this is a um, accelerator which uh, shoots a whole bunch of material, uh, probably in an ionized form, through some machine and some samples go straight and some samples bend, and that allows them to separate out different isotopes of elements. So something like this would be used for measuring the amount of uh, just slightly different 
uh, atoms like carbon 12, carbon 14, nitrogen 14. So they only count uh, the ones that they care about and they counted very accurately. So that's science for you.